So to talk about painting and meditation actually brings together two things, probably the two things, apart from my family, that I am most passionate about. And what I'd like to do is to ask you, invite you, in fact, to just right now, just sit and just breathe. Just sit quietly. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm not going to ask you to think about anything. I just want you to just sit. Just feel your feet on the floor. Feel your bottom on the chair. Glass in your hand. And just notice your breathing. So just notice as you're breathing in, you breathe out in a very natural, unforced way. Just your body doing what it does. It breathes in and it breathes out. And already I can feel a difference in the room. And there's a sense of people arriving. So thank you. That's all there is to it. And go now. <laughs> and welcome. You have arrived. So let me tell you a little bit about me and why, why am I so interested in the subject. So my name is Val Stevenson and in terms of meditation, my background goes back to when I was 18 and went up to Newcastle to the first transcendental meditation sessions that were held in the city. And from there on, it sort of peppered my life. I lived for many years next door to Amarifati Buddhist Monastery in Hertfordshire, which is a monastic community, it's a Thai community and was able to spend a lot of time with them meditating on retreats, on silent retreats, supporting that community. And then later on, I took on the role of organising the National Network of Buddhist Groups in the UK. And that was kind of a, that is a really important thing because in order for the sort of Buddhist voice, if you like, to have any say in education, chaplaincy, working in prisons, burying people, there has to be some sort of collective voice. And that's the sort of thing we were involved in. More recently, and very much connected, I have become really interested in the earth wisdom practices, the connection to the earth and I have I have done a vision quest which is five days in Snowden with only water and um, I have for the last two or three years been studying medicine wheel teachings which is a, a way of just looking at your life but using the indigenous medicine wheel teachings that things reside in different directions and it's all connected <coughs> And as a painter, I, like many, didn't get to do the degree when I was young, but diddled off when I was about 40 and did a fine art degree. And then I did a master's degree in drawing. And then I had a scholarship to do a PhD at Kingston. And, uh, yeah, we fell out with each other, basically. And I, instead of getting a doctorate, ended up in Salisbury, turning another page and a new chapter in my life. So you can see where the two strands come from. And in terms of how I paint, these are my paintings, and the thing that I'm really interested in is exploring a kind of direct mark, a, 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 what the brush stroke can say. You know, the, the kind of really, what I would call that gutsy handmade mark. So, where do we start? You know, meditation, 
is such a big word. It's an, a really, it's, a, it's like a coverall word for so many things. And there are so many ways that you can meditate. Now, I have to say, this never was me. I've never <laughs> in my life been able to sit full lotus, even when I was young. I um, prefer to sit on a chair now. But meditation can be a sitting meditation. It can be a walking meditation. You can lie and meditate. Um, you can meditate using mantras and singing and voice. You can meditate on a candle. You can meditate on your breath. And <clears throat> you can also, in my opinion, meditate when you don't even think you're meditating. So, as many of you are artists, and the sort of rituals that you do, the way you set up to paint, or draw, or make, whatever you do, that how you put things together. You know, when you go into the studio, do you have a set routine, or the place where you work? And those rituals, to my mind, are meditations. They're a way of kind of moving yourself into a different place in your mind. The thing that all meditation, I think, has in common is that it's all about a quality of attention and an awareness, an awareness of in most cases, what we call the here and now, you know, the, the reality, what it, what it is to be here and now, without the busyness that's going on. Or in the case of transcendental meditation, then I guess to, to move into some sort of higher plane. But very much about being able to calm the brain and to cultivate what we would call an awareness. And in terms of, you know, we have this definition or explanation, if you like, of what meditation can be. And then we have painting and art. And, you know, how can we link the two? And in my book, stories are always good. And the first story I'd like to tell you is one which some of you may have heard. So there were four artists going to paint a hen. There were three Westerners and there was one Chinese artist. And they sat themselves around the farmyard, got their gear out and set about drawing <coughs> and painting this hen. So the Westerners <coughs> looked and then sort of started to measure, get the proportion right, get the angle of the leg right get the movement right, and the Chinese person did nothing. The Chinese artist just sat there and sat, sat, and just looked, just sat quietly, and then picked up a brush, dipped it in the paint, and did essence, what I would call essence of hen. It somehow captured everything there was to capture about that hen, beyond what it looked like, that somehow there's this, this, and, and words are always tricky. Words cannot describe, in many ways, some of the things that I want to talk about. So words will always be a struggle. But essence of hen is probably good enough. Something that's sort of fundamental, something that just says, you know, that, that's, that is everything that needs to be said. We don't need the rest. I think <clears throat> one thing that is important is that, you know, we are, we are Westerners and we, ca we can't ape Eastern culture and sensibility. And I think when people do, it looks pretty dreadful. We don't have that culture, we don't have that history. We can study it, we can study it over the years, we can get, you know, pretty not bad, but somehow <clears throat> there seems to me to be a need to respect our Western culture and tradition. 
and the most amazing bits of work are where people take those Eastern ideas and bring them into a Western culture and into Western art. And that, I think, is when they're really potent. <coughs> <coughs> And the other thing I think to say is that <clears throat> what I'm talking about is not, it's not an academic paper. This is not really something I can go and research and come back and say, this is fact, and this is fact, and this is fact. And in, t in sympathy with the way of thinking of meditation and of the Eastern philosophies, what is important is doing, living, believing, doing, embodying, practicing, all of those sort of words, very down to earth. Um, it's a bit like, you know, you can read a diet book, but it doesn't make you thin. <laughs> it's, um, out to do is say, well, okay, how can I open up this subject? And um, come on the next slide, John. What I decided was that what would be really useful and interesting, I thought, would be to look at se several aspects of meditation and then to relate them to the paintings of three artists whose work just knocks my socks off. <clears throat> and the three artists I chose were Henry Matisse, Ivan Hitchens, and Giorgio Morandi. Very different. Very, very different artists. But the key to why I chose them is, is in sort of my response to their work, to their paintings. You know, I could have there are some artists who explicitly reference meditation. There's a very famous um, Marina Abramovich piece where she sits in a gallery meditating all day and people come and sit beside her and the piece is, you know, that, that experience. But I was more interested in what might be implicit in the paintings, in what I see, and also what the artists and people who've written about them have actually said, what, their connect, what connections they have made. So, <clears throat> next one, please. So, this is good old Giorgio Morandi. Um, has anybody been to Bologna? Brings me to yeah. Bologna. Yeah. <coughs> to the foundation. Ah. And the next one. Go. Does everyone know George and Randy? Or some people are quite not sure. Okay, George and Randy um, is most notably known for the fact that he painted this sort of thing his entire life. Um, he lived with three sisters, and the sort of romantic story is that he never left, you know, Bologna. Da, da. But in actual fact, that's not quite true because he was exposed to, um, you know, the Italian futurists, and he did meet Cezanne, who had a big impression on him. Beyond that, yes, he did. Indeed, he did. He arranged and rearranged endlessly pots. And he painted, and I call him the painter of pots and paesaggios. He painted local um, scenes, local village scenes, just very ordinary scenes. When I see um, a Mirandi, it just knocks me into a kind of contemplative state in the, Bolog in the Bologna, when you're, you're surrounded with them. And yet they're all in some ways the same, <coughs> but there is a quietness about them. There's a, something you can't quite pinpoint about them. <clears throat> And this certainly touched what I would say is a sort of place very deep. Sean Scully, the artist, has written a lot about Mirandian. Um, Sean Scully said, if we look for Buddhist art in unlikely places, 
we must be prepared to find it in unlikely forms. And I ask you to consider the work of Giorgio Morandi. Next one, please. This Englishman, Iophon Hitchens, um, <coughs> his father was an artist, his sons are artists, and um, Hitchens is most well known for the paintings of the woodland around where he lived in West Sussex. And he went out in all weathers and he painted. And the next one. This is one of his. I think uh, Hitchens, to me, was a bit patchy. And some of them, there were times when he was absolutely on the money. And this is one of them. And the beauty of it to me is that I don't actually even know, need to know whether it's trees. But I believe it. Whatever he's, he's telling me, I'm believing it. And the next one, the third artist, is Henri Matisse. Who, if, if I go into a, a, a gallery which have show showing Matisse, I really, I want to sing and dance and there's just this kind of affirmation of life and living and just indescribable pleasure of seeing Matisse's paintings. And interesting, he himself said, I don't know whether I believe in God. I think, really, I'm some sort of Buddhist. But the essential thing is to put oneself in the frame of mind which is close to that of prayer. There's a very lovely book, which is the um, <coughs> uh, 1941 Unpublished Interviews with Matisse. Um, he agreed to collaborate this book, which was going to be all about his life, and they got as far as him agreeing what the dust jacket would have, and then he pulled it and he said, no, 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 I just, I just don't want it out there. And it has been published, but it has some really lovely insights into what he says about how he works and why he works. And besides saying he was a Buddhist, he also says, when I wake up in the morning, I need to set off with a killer energy. I'm not quite sure how that fits in. And I guess he's not talking literally. What he's talking about is just that oomph to get out there and to work. But he calls it the, yeah, the energy as if I was going to kill somebody. So, next one, please. And this is Matisse, you know, well-known, the Red Room. We'll talk a bit more about the, the paintings themselves. But I just have to tell you, you know, it just makes me want to dance for joy. The next one, please. So, these are the <coughs> aspects that I identified. And I'm just going to go through them and just talk about what they might be, what they might mean to us as artists, and what, you know, Matisse, Morandi and Ivan Hitchens said themselves or others might have said about them. Next slide. So, settling the brizzy brain. Always a good plan. Um, for myself, I walk my dog up the lane from where I live every morning. And I set off thinking, I'm just going to walk and just, you know, appreciate the wood, the trees, the birds. And before I've gone ten paces, there's, so then I'd better ring such and such a And then I'd sort of walk and say, just let it go. And then blow me down, I'm thinking, oh, there's no eggs left. <laughs> <laughs> so it really is a, a, a difficult one. And it's not about <coughs> emptying your brain. People tend to think it's about emptying your brain or stopping thought. In actual fact, the nature of the mind is to think, is to be busy. And what we're talking about is, is getting to a point where you can notice that and then just kindly bring yourself back. Because that's, that's where the beauty is in just bringing yourself back. And the next one. So in terms of settling the busy brain, 
a lot of stories. I like stories a lot. So there is a Zen master, and someone from the lecture from the university comes to see him. And he says to the Zen master, I want you to teach me, I want to interview you, I want some information for my book, I want to um, learn everything I can from you, um, I've already been to such and such a Zen master over the hill, and this is what I've learned, and um, I, I think this is what I need to look at next, da 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 And the Zen master said, let's have tea. So, he makes the tea, and he starts to pour the university lecturer a cup, and he pours, and he pours, and he pours, and he pours, and the cup overflows, and there's tea going everywhere. And the lecturer said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And the Zen master said, you're already too full. And that's such a beautifully simple and graphic way of teaching, to say, you're too full, your head is too full, there is no room. Henri Matisse would say, for me, silence and isolation are useful. Only superficial painters need to fear them. And for all of us, when we go to paint or even go into a gallery, you know, how often do you kind of dash into a gallery? <clears throat> I think I've got 20 minutes. I'll get around here in 20 minutes. Or, um, I know people say to me, oh, it must be lovely being a painter. You can just pop in and paint for half an hour. Well, no, it takes me half an hour to think about even just getting into the space and perhaps getting the brushes out or whatever. It just doesn't work that way. Look at the next slide. So, tuning in, opening up, letting go, trusting, not knowing. There are all aspects of what we would say is a meditation practice. And um, it's I think what I would say is that we, we tend to over-rely on one or more of our senses. We tend to, as painters, over-rely on sight and looking at things. So I find it a really useful thing to do a, just a short meditation when I'm going to start painting or something, where I... <coughs> close my eyes and I concentrate on that smell and I just think what can I smell and what's closest and what's further away and what's further away from there and sound is a very beautiful one because it's amazing the sounds there are when you think there aren't any <clears throat> touch I mean how many times do we actually touch a painting when we're painting it, or the feel of the canvas, or the feel of some collage when you're actually going to use it. They're all, they're all ways of tuning in to what we're doing. I'd have to say taste is probably a bit tricky. I'm not sure I'd quite want to go and lick the paint. But <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> we, if we can sort of sharpen the senses, then we can reconnect or even connect better with our bodies and with what we're doing. Um, for myself, okay, I have lots of ritual. I burn some white sage, which is a kind of blessing to the space. I always thank the space I'm in. If I'm outdoors, I will thank the trees and the grass and the sky and the clouds and just a kind of gesture of gratitude for it, just for being there. And when I finished, I have to remember to thank the place, the space, the time, and nature. So, can we go to the next slide? So, 
This, I think, is an interesting, in terms of tuning in, this was a, a project that I did eight years ago now. And I was asked, when I was doing my master's degree, I was asked to record my summer. And I thought, you know. And what I decided to do was to, I got a little singing bowl, a pot of Chinese ink, and a two-inch decorator's brush, because I was very mindful of this, not wanting to pretend I was a Chinese brush painter when I'm clearly not one. And my idea was that somehow what I was feeling about the day would come through my arm in that repetitive stroke. So it would be different each day because how I was feeling, which would be a reflection of my summer, would change. And I did 30 a day for 30 days. So I ended up with 900 of these. And they were um, shown on a gallery wall. And <clears throat> whilst I wouldn't say, I could hand on heart say, I was happy that day, or I was about to go on holiday that day, what I could say is that um, there was a depth to the drawings that came out of that repetition and that attention to just tuning in again and again and again. So the next slide, please. So <clears throat> this is Ivan Hitchens, and I'd really like to just go to what he says about what he, his painting. He says, I seek first to unravel the essential meaning of my subject, which is synonymous with its structure, and to understand my own psychological reaction to it. I then paint a quick sketch, followed by a careful, well-knit design, which I then destroy and I start all over again, painting freely, regardless of the literal proportions of the forms. He said, I should like things to fall into place with so clear a notation that the spectator's eye and aesthetic ear shall receive a clear message, a clear tune. So he's really tuning in to what he's doing. And next one, please, is Matisse. I, even now, you see, every time one comes up, I smile. <clears throat> In terms of opening up, well, we're very literally opening up the windows. But the way Matisse opens up is very much by bringing the outside inside. He doesn't um, you know, give you a perspective where you disappear into the distance. And what he said, in his own words, was that, for me, the space from the horizon to the inside of the room is continuous, and the boat which passes lives in the same space as the objects around me. The wall around the windows does not create two worlds. So he's very much, he's opening something up, and it's almost offering it on a plate. He's offering it with that flatness, with the colour, with the patterning. It's, a, to me, just a very generous offering. And the next one, please. Um, this is a Mirandi, a very, very beautiful, minimal sketch. And the next one, which is this one. And I, I think that, you know, Mirandi asks us to tune in by minimize, by by really going minimal. There is, he gets rid of the labels of things. He goes for muted colours. He <coughs> um, flattens the surface largely, <coughs> and is asking us really just to accept, accept these this image, these bottles, these jugs, and the relationship between them. <coughs> One. So, we have two monks. This is the older monk, the teacher, this is the novice. 
and the novice sits there for a long while and he says, what happens then? And the answer is, nothing happens next. This is it. <coughs> so he's asking him really to let go of his grasping mind about, you know, what's next, what's going to happen? How will I know when something's happened? And uh, another very lovely story, the abbot at, at the monastery that I mentioned earlier um, told a very lovely story of a young monk, well not a young monk, a middle-aged monk really, who after 20 odd years came to him and said, look, I'm going to disrobe. I feel I, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm just not getting it. And Samedo just burst into laughter and said, what he doesn't get is there's nothing to get. He definitely hasn't got it. Because he's still looking for something in the same way as this young chap is looking for something. So in terms of us as artists and you know, people who are particularly practice, you know, practicing artists, you know, what, what might we let go of? Do you have any idea of things that you might want to let go of that may be hindering what you're doing? Desire for recognition. Yay! <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it's such a hard it's one, one. <laughs> to actually not somewhere, in some, no matter how much you try to push it away, somewhere be imagining that this is somebody's going to really appreciate this one. Anything else you might, Jenny? Making a pretty picture. Yes, making a pretty picture. Yeah. 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 And I guess, guess also the idea of a finished painting, that somehow if we can sit more with the, the, the doing and the unfolding and not to let things resolve too quickly. I think as artists it's very easy to resolve paintings and if we're able to hold them open as long as we can then when they do drop in then they are much more interesting the next one please so it's gosh connecting you know, our meditation, yes, it connects us. It connects us to ourselves. It connects us to our inner <coughs> self. And, <clears throat> and it connects us to our environment, but not in a... But, but in a more equal way, in a more commune... What's the word? Com like commu a communion, I think is the word I want. And the next one... Yeah, the you know, Dalai Lama. Our ancient experience confirms at every point that everything is linked together and everything is inseparable. When we have a connection with what we're doing, I think it shows in the result. And then I think it's a bit of a challenge to, to sort of let go at that point. And how do other people connect? So what we'd be looking for, if we were painters, artists, would be a connection which has depth and authenticity and integrity and all those sort of words, but that leaves space for someone to come to it and to, to approach it on their own terms. So it's not something that's actually just you know, beating you around the head and saying, this is what it's about. Next one, please. I think Hitchens has a lot to contribute in terms of thinking about connection. And <clears throat> very beautifully, to me, the rhythms of colour across what he's, he's, you know, he's, he does. They're often um, a panorama. They're really quite wide, not very deep. So you can't really see them all in one go. You, s you have to sweep across them. And the... <coughs> <clears throat> the very act of doing that sort of connects you to the painting 
But what he uses beautifully as well is white space. He was very keen on white space and how that can connect as well as the colour and the shape. And the repeating colour and repeating shape. Just very, very luscious and beautiful. Uh, Jonathan Clark wrote about Hitchens. Once or twice in every generation, there is an artist who stands out as being utterly fused with their own landscape. Their work marinated in the place they inhabit. And Ivan Hitchens is one such artist. And he did. He went out in all weathers and to the same places in his wood in Sussex and painted. The next one, please. In terms of connection, I think Matisse is just, does it in a different way. Matisse very much is about repetition of pattern, which connects the whole image, about repetition of the motif, the lemons, <coughs> the shapes, the colours, and the use of the complementary colours. So he's connecting the whole time. And Matisse said, you know, when we speak of nature, it's wrong to forget that we ourselves are part of nature. We ought to view ourselves with the same curiosity and openness with which we study a tree, a sky, a thought, because we too are linked to the entire universe. And I think he plays that out beautifully with these interiors because this is, in some ways, a universe, as is the interior, and the whole thing just comes together. This is it. The next one. Apart from pots, um, Mirandi also did a series of paisaggios, which were around where he lived. They were um, around the villagers, always in very muted colours, showing the brush strokes. And the, I think the, the fact that he mutes the colours so beautifully really connects the whole of... The, you know, it's a real coherency to that painting. It really... Um, it, it's not saying lots of things, but what it is saying, it's saying beautifully and minimally. There's, a, again, a, a very nice quote about Mirandi. <clears throat> Whenever I look at Mirandi's work, an emotion, an emotion, then an astonishment in regard to that very emotion takes off from this dual state of mind and mood. So it's an emotion, and then what, what is that emotion? And... and and somehow takes you somewhere else. So he's, he's dumbing down the <coughs> representation, the what this is, the what you're looking at. And in doing so, he's, he's, putting, he's offering this, this sort of contemplative scene. Uh, the, the sort of main... Um, well-known book on Mirandi is, is by Karen Wilkin and she says the dialogue between the specific and the elemental is at the heart of his work and I think that's quite right and he does it in such a delicately sort of nuanced way but just such simplicity and the next one please So I've, I've titled this sort of essence, non-duality, simplifying. You know, why, why might it be a good idea for us to engage with any of this yes, as painters? Anybody has it a guess? Guess. <coughs> Next one, John. The, this, this, these are what they call Enzo circles. They're traditionally done in one stroke. And what they signify is a moment when the mind is free to let the body create. 
It's the state of absolute enlightenment. This is it. And they are certainly simple. Now, I can look around the gallery here and I can see most every piece of work people have been engaged in simplifying. Getting, putting away the, the extra bits, trying to refine the message to say, this is what I want to say. This is what's important. And to spoil it down to the, the sort of the single message next one. Only Matisse painted some, to my mind, absolutely stunning oil sketches. This is uh, one of his and in terms of simplifying something to its essence, I think he does it so well. We have a road, we have a tree, we have some clouds and that's it. But as an image, it is beautifully satisfying to look at. There is a harmony and the repetition of the shape, you know, the clouds and through, this is very simple stuff. You know, we have sort of cotton wool bits on the tree and we've got cotton wool shapes. I'm completely prepared to believe it. Absolutely prepared to believe it. And that's as much like a tree as it needs to look like. And as always with Matisse, there's that lovely rhythm of shapes across the surface. Matisse <coughs> said himself that he wanted to loosen us off from habitual thoughts and presumptions about things. And I think he does it well here. And he also says, exactitude is not truth. And that really says it, doesn't it? You know, exactly, that's not truth but he knows what he's looking for. In the book I mentioned, the 1941 un <laughs> unpublished interviews, Matisse said, <clears throat> the first works I did from nature were always a bit simplistic in composition. But then I was led by sensations that took me away, something that I needed to find out. I remember meditating on a lemon posed on the corner of a black marble mantelpiece. Suppose I copied that lemon. What would I have gained? Why did it interest me? Was it the beautifulest lemon ever? Deduction by deduction, I realised that what intrigued me was the reaction created by contemplation of the objects. So his reaction to him contemplating the relationship between those objects. The yellow of the peel against <coughs> the black. And I knew that I had to invent something to render the equivalence of my sensations. So he's quite clearly thought through, deduced, worked through and decided that's what I'm after. And those of you who came to... Um, <clears throat> Ian McKeever's talk, name Nelly went. I think he said, and I've heard many other people say, you can hang a painting on anything subject wise. And I think what Matisse does there is he, he po points to that very clearly because he said, this, this is what I'm searching for, this equivalence of sensation to you know, having contemplated my reaction to this thing. And it could be an interior, it could be a portrait, it could be a landscape. So in, in some ways, the subject matter um, becomes really less relevant. What he said was, there's a sort of emotional communion created among the objects. And I think that's a fascinating and really useful idea. A communion, a, chain, a sharing or exchange of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when this is on a mental or spiritual level. And I think certainly for me, when I look at paintings, that's really what I'm looking for. That sort of 
exchange on a level which is beyond the the evidence of the <coughs> colour, the rhythm, you know, the the way the materials are used. But they the the sort of formal aspects, the the things, the materials we use are the way we point towards this thing. Um, again, the the same Buddhist teacher, I, I the abbot that I knew, he had been um, a Buddhist monk for 50 years, so I'll tell you how many millions of hours he'd been meditating. But he used to say, <clears throat> I can't tell you, I don't have words, I can tell you stories, I can talk to you and I can point towards this thing but there are actually no words and I think that um, some of the things that I've been talking about in terms of the formal qualities and the, you know, the way paint's used, the way the surface is used, they're the sort of formal that's the pointing bit because if you think about it, if we could kind of identify this thing well A, we'd all run off and be enlightened well, tomorrow the latest and we'd all be utterly brilliant painters. So the, there is something just in that working with those, um, <clears throat> the formal aspects and that extra something, that other element that really um, is something that I think meditation can give us sort of clues towards. The next one. This is about as simple as it gets, I think, in terms of Mirandi. Three pots. Not five now, we're down to three. But I have to say that looking at this, it looks, it's a small, it's a simple composition, but it kind of feels like the universe. It feels like the entire world at the same time. And uh, again, I, I have to go to Sean Scully, who just writes beautifully about Mirandi. And what he said is, Mirandi telescopes his process of studying the objects, the painting of what he sees, and our observation of it. So he's kind of teles telescoping, it's a good word. What results is an evocation of meditative release from judgment and from the driven quality of perceptual habit. He uses descriptive representation to achieve its opposite. Well, how clever is that? So he's, he's evoking a sort of meditative response in us. And so that, you know, I'm not actually very interested in, in whether it's a pot. It just, it just is, it's just there. So can we go to the next one, please? We're back to Hitchens. <coughs> and I put this in to, just to really revisit this idea about you know, the, the essence of something. Autumn larch and chestnut wood. I wouldn't know if it was a larch tree or a chestnut tree, I, but I kind of don't need to know. I'm happy to go along with it. And he achieves that Again, because he, ha he flattens the surface and he, he doesn't have you know, things disappearing, so there's no hierarchy. He's not saying this bit's more important than this bit. That it actually just has this lovely rhythm on the surface, which I, I, I think is towards that idea of the... Of, of the essence of it, it, this is what it is. It's not a bit of this and a bit of that. It, it, there is a sort of entirety to, about it. I've said a few times, and I think uh, it's certainly in terms of the painters I've chosen, is the idea of flatness is important. That they, they, don't, they keep everything on the surface. They bring the background forward. And <coughs> we're invited to really just be in that surface. And uh, certainly Matisse, there, there is such a harmony 
And what puzzles me is that I don't get bored. And very often I find if things have too much harmony, I find them quite boring. And I come to the conclusion that it's, it's a bit like the difference between Muzak and music. Muzak is good enough, kind of floats by my head. Pleasant, not memorable. But music, with attention to each note, which is like my teeth with each colour, with each, um, the rhythm of the shapes, is like pure music, and that's why it doesn't get boring. So, again, please. Next one. Okay, there's no <coughs> easy ride. <laughs> Repetition, dedication and practice. Um, the next slide will go straight into that. Yeah, You can't get away from it. Though. You must turn up. You must do the inches, which is a, a Christopher Baker quote. Do the inches. Meditation, a meditation practice for life. But then not beating yourself up if you don't do it. And um, Matisse said, why have I never been bored? For more than 50 years, I have never ceased to work, and he didn't. So he was just worked constantly. And he also said, do not wait for inspiration. It comes while you're working. So I do think there is an awful lot of truth in the need to just keep doing things, whether it's repeating the same image or whether it's um, you know, it's just doing something to keep going, to keep that process alive. Matisse said, an artist must possess nature. He must identify himself with her rhythms by efforts that will prepare the mastery which will later enable him to express himself in his own language. So it's a mastery, and that just comes through work, through doing it. I can't imagine, I didn't start painting 50 years ago. I, I think it would be amazing to imagine if, if you painted. Has anybody here painted for 50 years? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's. And would you would you concur with the idea of practice and repetition? Yes, it's it's it is hard work. It's just um, turning up and, and thinking, and just working. Uh -huh. It's as simple as that. Really. Yeah, simple. Still as enjoy it. <laughs> so you're with Matthias, fifty years. And boredom? Hmm? Boredom? Oh no. Never, ever, never, ever. Not for one minute. Not for one minute. No. So Matisse and Rod <laughs> from the same. Can I just say that Matisse had the advantage of the south of France and the weather. <laughs> this is <true. laughs> Yeah, this is true. Yeah. Although Ivan Hitchens, I mean, it's that true. is a bit, yeah. bit grim. But yes, yeah. Yes, Matisse, you'd imagine, couldn't you, with the sort of open French doors. <laughs> Who wouldn't sit there and happily paint? And probably someone else doing shopping. Pardon? Yeah. And probably someone else doing shopping. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder whether there's eggs in there for an omelette. Yes. Yeah. Show the next one. <laughs> so, yeah. When he was ill, and he's still working, um, there's no more to be said. And interestingly, I... Um, I don't recall putting that on the side. It appeared. I obviously did put it there, but I thought, since she wants to be there, she can stay. Because um, Matisse was quite clear that he, his main interest was in, in people. That's what he liked doing best. Uh, but, you know, can you imagine being so ill and recovering from huge operations and things and saying, get the scissors on coloured paper, you know, and I still need to do things. Uh, Next one, please. Ah. I like this this photograph. I I wonder how many hours this guy sat there like that because he did apparently look and think 
and move, subtly change, look at shadow, look at size, get another bottle, change the bottle, until he eventually decided, this is what I'm going to do. Next. So this is, okay, this is Ivan Hitchens in for a session. He's going to paint. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I like this because it, in some ways he looks so unlike a painter to me. And yet, he is. This is indoors. He apparently went indoors on Christmas Day. He painted outdoors um, until the weather forced him in. What size are his paintings? They're about, about four feet. Quite big. Why? Yeah. Some of them bigger. I think he's got a, isn't it Cecil Sharp House that have got, a, I think, a mural on the wall, which is the entire wall he did. They're, they're pretty, they're quite big. You, you know, they're certainly not this size. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's said that he dedicated his adult life to listening, which comes back to our thing about the senses, listening to the subtlest nuances of the English landscape. In all weathers, he braved the elements. You know, we're just, we're Turner at the mast here, aren't we? Painting the six acres of woodland surrounding his home an intensely private retreat on the Sussex Downs. In increasingly broad, spontaneous, abstract brushstrokes, deliberated with well-deliberated abandon. Now there's another whole subject to the talk, isn't it? How do we, how do, we do well-deliberated abandon? <laughs> he describes his impressions of water, foliage, sky and trees. Can we have the next one, John, please? <coughs> and finally, this, this is kind of very dear to my heart, this one. This idea that um, meditation, and certainly for me in my painting, it's about making something which is quite ordinary appear extraordinary. <coughs> but not by changing it, but by just by concentrating on its ordinariness. By really going for how ordinary this is, this domestic ordinariness. And the next one, oh, okay, another story. So we have again the Zen master and the novice. And the Zen master says, have you eaten your rice porridge today? And the student says, I have eaten. And the Zen master says, then you'd better wash your bowl. It's profound and very minimal. It's, it's really saying, don't get your head caught up in all sorts of thoughts, thinking about the meaning of life. Just do it. Just go and wash your bowl. And in the washing, you'll find all you need. And I think, um, certainly, I find I, I can very easily get completely tied up in my head in thinking and researching and reading and ideas and um, my studio is the, the <coughs> graveyard for good ideas and and also um, I don't know whether anybody else finds this if I sit and look at a painting I think, well, what, is, what does it mean what, what does it mean and then I think I know what it needs I get what it is on brush. I do that. It's the last thing that painting needed. It's the absolute last thing. Because it's something that I've thought out. In my head, consciously, worked out that it really needed that yellow to be something, an ochre or something. So I go and do it. And of course, I get what I thought of. I don't get anything more, anything less. And it, there is... Yeah, it has to be scrubbed off. So can we have the next one? I th again, I come back to these beautiful, beautiful Matisse sketches. And in many ways, this is an ordinary scene for him. OK, we're on the south of France. This is, you know, maybe not here, but it is for him. And um, in just going for that, 
to capture that ordinariness in quite a quick and spontaneous way. There's the most beautiful freshness. And it, it's not perfect, it's not correct in many ways in, that we might, you know, wonder about, you know, or choose, you know, whoever has feet that shape. Know, but they're my favourite bit. <laughs> they, exactly. You, you you just believe them. They're, they're there as shoes. They're also there as shapes and angles and anchoring and uh, you know the sort of beautiful lightness next to it to draw attention to it and to the lilac stockings and the whole thing is just 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 gorgeous. And I think I, I actually prefer some of the sketch-like quality to some of the finished, finished bigger pieces. Over the next one. So, here we are, <laughs> back with Mirandi. And um, we're talking about making the domestic extraordinary. Well, it just doesn't get much more domestic, does it? You know, in terms of pictures and pots. <coughs> And again, I have to go to Sean Scully, who just, as I say, writes so beautifully about Mirandi. And he says, Mirandi produces a feeling of communion with the ordinary. It's that word again. I think that's a really useful word. A communion with the ordinary. And looking at his work, we sense a stillness. <clears throat> the pitcher, the bottle, provide their own stability and balance. In the limitation of his motifs appears the abundance of his world. So there's that idea of this very domestic, small place, but it's, to my mind, it's like you look through a keyhole and you end up in Arizona. It's just got that wonderful sense of, of everythingness about it. Can I have the next one? What more can you say? And again, this is one of mine, the colour's not brilliant. For, uh, for me, the making the ordinary extraordinary, this, uh, this is the road to Great Wishford. This was a morning in the summer when it was blisteringly hot and that was where I was. Now, yes, I've you know, changed it, I've moved the composition, but the grounding it in that place, in that road, is really important to me. It's not any old road, that's the road to Great Wishford. The next one, and that is the corner of a lake at Langford Lakes, which you're talking about how uh, Matisse, you know, being in the south of France, I went to paint there one day, lugged everything out of the car, got down to the corner of the lake, decided where I was going to paint, and then I was completely covered in black flies. I was eating them, they were going to my nose, through in my eyes. I'm not a whim, I just couldn't deal with it. So I did a few sketches and then just gave up. <laughs> and the next one. Yes, farmhouse. Matt, uh, Hitchens, the ordinary. His, his wood in Sussex, endlessly, just going back and back <coughs> and back. So that's, you know, not only making the ordinary extraordinary, it's also that dedication and practice. So, again, the next one, please. There we go. We've done a quick run-through. We've sort of highlighted some aspects of meditation, put some words around them, rubbed across Matisse, Hitchens and... Um, Giorgio Mirandi and it come out the other end really so the next one please so I have to I have to leave the last word to Matisse and he remember he wrote this a long time ago everything we see in our daily life is more or less distorted by acquired habits how true is that and this is perhaps evident in an age like ours where cinema posters, never mind you know, virtual media and Facebook and God as well else, and magazines present us every day with a flood of ready-made images, which to the eye, <coughs> which are to the eye what prejudices are to the mind. 
the first step towards creation is to see everything as it really is, and that demands a constant effort. And that brings us back to really the definition of meditation and the purpose of meditation and, and that idea of to see things as they really are, to calm the brain, to settle the brain, to <coughs> tune in, to let go of our habitual perceptual patterns and to see things as they really are. And of course you don't get away without effort. Um, I think one absolutely final word I love Matisse's quote, he says, we need to always leave something to mystery. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also very true. Mm. So if anyone has any questions, anything you'd like to comment or say, I realise there's lots of things. <laughs> well, it's very interesting that you've got three artists there and in a way they deal with in completely different areas of work yeah. and um, the message is, is a constant um, but the contrast between Mat Matisse and Mirandi is huge mm -hmm. and in a way um, Hitchens kind of sits between the two mm -hmm. um, and it's just interesting the fact that you've got three very different languages there yeah. of paint yeah. but with, uh, with your message yeah yeah <coughs> yeah Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's part of why I chose them, because the message was, was the, the thing, and to say, look, it, it can be all of these different sorts of paintings. Which gives us a chance. <laughs> yes. 50 years, though, we need to do what we want to do. 50 years. I did notice, though, with Morandi, I mean, the other two are <clears throat> some of my favourite artists, um, but Morandi I, I hadn't heard of, so thank okay. you for him. Um, but I did notice with his paintings, you know, you have the, the immediacy of everything being very simple, and yet the more you looked at it, the more you noticed that actually that black line isn't a black line, it's, you know, some of it's grey, and it's a different grey to this brown, and that the backgrounds, you know, one half of it is kind of a warm pink, <coughs> the other half is bluer, you know, and it's more, the, the idea of kind of, you talked at the beginning about sort of meditating on an image almost. And I think with his work, it seems that you can really sort of delve in and see a lot more than what's immediately presented to you. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, you, you're a great fan, aren't you? I am. Yeah, I mean, because they, they, in a way, they are the, the, the sort of meditation. Mm -hmm. um, like some, some painters like Rothko, you know, you can just sit and stare for a long time and um, it does empty the mind mm. you, know, you can really just lose yourself in, in those images there's, there's almost too much narrative in my thesis for that sense of losing yourself um, Hitchens, well it's, it's as exciting as being, being in a windy wood on a, on a winter walk I yeah. mean, so the emotions are hugely varied in, yeah. in what you've shown us yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I knew a, a, a Buddhist nun and she was actually at the time referring to the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh, and she said it's like bathing in warm custard <laughs> and I feel that Mirandi, I have that feeling, it's like bathing in warm custard you know, it's just wonderful So when you're, sorry, yeah. when you're in your studio and you're, you've done your sage yeah. and cleansing and yeah. you're, mm. you've attained your meditative mm. state mm. Do you feel more? Do you feel that you're more consciously aware? You know, are you more conscious, or have you let something else take over your conscious brain and your thinking now in a kind of like, or your being in a kind of more of a um, an awareness brain? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's combine words, those two it? different words things. Fall yeah. short always. They do. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I would be able to make such a great claim as that. I think some things I do find, if I don't do those things, then I sort of scratch around a bit and I, I find it much harder to get into what I'm doing. So it's possibly a way of actually getting into what I'm doing. Where does the muse come? I think it just comes when it wants. Sometimes it can be the first brush stroke I do in the day and sometimes it will be the last one and sometimes it's none at all. 
Um, so, again, I suppose it, it is, if I could say and respond to you and say, yes, if I do all of these things, I am in a better, different, more meditative state, and it shows in my paintings, well, I would just do it all the time, it'd all be great. It, so it's, it's, it, it's not linear like that, I find. Yeah. Does anyone else have an experience of, of meditating with and, and preparing to paint that would kind of speak to this? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I do. I do the same thing. You do the same thing? Yeah. Okay. You see, I think drawing is meditation. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't need to, to do what you do, mm. but you also talked about work. Yeah. Um, you, you don't create things by having an idea. I found, as, as, a, as a designer, that yes, an idea can set you off on a course, but then you, you get to a point where, where the idea and the resolution is too complex. And the one thing you can't afford to hold on to is the idea. Mm -hmm. You have to throw that away mm -hmm. because you know it, it, it's too it's too important. Therefore, you can't compromise it. And if you can't compromise it, then you can't mm -hmm. take your work further. Right. So I always you know, would know that if I'm stuck, bin that mm -hmm. and use all the other work because that's where the thoughts come in from from the side, if you like. Yeah. Which is your message: work is the essence of creativity. Just yeah. simple work. Then yeah. then. The, the invention will come. Yeah. And I think what you said about things coming in from the side <coughs> is yeah. very, very relevant. <coughs> Do other people find that? There's a lot of nodding. Yeah, yeah. the thing that just kind of appears, you think, wow! Yeah. The, the only thing that strikes me is that when you started and you started talking about doing your meditation and then talking about whether you bought the eggs, which is what I do too. Yeah. <laughs> right. How does that differ from the Zen Buddhist who said, are you eating rice? Have you washed your bowl? Say that again. I got caught up with you saying about eggs. <laughs> yes, about <laughs> eggs. How does that differ from the Zen Buddhist who then said to his pupil, are you eating rice? Are you washing your bowl? Because that is still moving to one side. It's not, it's no more whole than whether you've bought the eggs. It's very difficult to describe, like as you say, whether, but, yeah. but you know that that is a, it's a side thought, just like your eggs were. Oh, I see, I see. Yes, yes. No. And, and that's what the mind does. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. But yeah. but but I think in your lecture you sort of made it sort of the, the Zen Buddhists were saying something yeah. whole, but you you would think about the eggs. We're not yeah. thinking about. The I whole. think it's about awareness yeah. Yeah. and being in that moment, this moment right now rather than thinking, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. But the Buddhist was, was doing that. He was sort he of was, he saying, said, you know, yeah, you're going to wash your bowl. Your rice, <laughs> the, ne the next step think, yeah. is wash your bowl. He then, was actually just doing a lesson at that point. Say, but but we all do it. We all do it all the time. Do, yes. yeah. Yeah. Because it, if we were able not to do it, we'd all be fully alive and being. <laughs> but the work we have is... is in that constantly bringing our mind back. Yeah. Is, is it because eating the rice and then washing the bowl, it's, it's another stage in the same process, whereas walking and buying eggs is different. Mm -hmm. If it's walking and then you go to the... to the shop. Well, no, no, <laughs> in that stage, that's walking, different. <laughs> and then you're going to follow a further path, that's the same as washing the bowl. And that would have been okay. It's, it's clouding your mind with things which have nothing to do with the walking, mm -hmm. whereas the eating the rice and then Washing the bowl is all part of the same all journey. All one action. All part of the same journey, isn't it? I think it's the, it's the, 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 the only way we can communicate is with words. Mm. So I guess the story with the, the rice and the washy bowl is the, the master's sort of pointing towards something with that story. Mm. But that story is not it. Mm. He's actually pointing towards it by mm. using that story. Because it's like me doing this talk. I, I've only got words. And they're, they're quite inadequate at times. You turn all right. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I'd, I'd like to close there, but to really remind you all that on December the 12th, um, Jasper Humphreys will be here talking about Kath Corbett's A Child of Her Time. So that will be, I think, a very different talk again. Mm -hmm.
and I uh, hope you'll come and support it. Thank you all very much for coming tonight.